You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Sinister Podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their inventory of classic vehicles and follow them on Instagram at Commonwealth underscore classics. Thank you, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 96 for March 2021. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me over Zoom, Harold, Morgan, and Dixon. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, well, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. Is that American or Canadian? <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> Dixon, how are you, sir? Not too bad. Enjoying the end of winter. Yes. Uh, it, it ends later in Canada, does it not? Slightly. I, I, you weren't with us last month. I assume you were uh, fondly looking across the border, see if you could see your truck. That's right. Trying to zoom, lens, biggest zoom lens I can find to see if I can focus in on New Jersey. Sadly, nope, there was a snowstorm in the way. I hope soon you are reunited. <laughs> so do I. Is it ready to roll? Uh, more or less, yes. So you just, if you could get your, your bod into the country, you could drive it out. With 47 gas stops, yes. Well, yeah, yes. but I mean, it, but it is theoretically drivable, so you could drive it. Ben has been driving the thing about the property, so it, it has oh. been exercised. So so it's going to be ready for another rebuild after after you, by the time you get there, because Ben's putting miles on it. Well, not that many. I hope it doesn't need to rebuild that quickly. Depends on how much he's driving it, I guess. And for the listeners, what is what is the truck exactly? 1951 80-inch. And how's Morgan doing? I am doing well. Our guest this month is returning champion Dan Greck. Dan has been overlanding Africa in a Jeep Wrangler. He's written a second book about his adventures called The Road Chose Me, Volume 2. Uh, Dan joined us to talk about his first book in September 2018. This time, Dan rolls his Jeep and tells us that Avis rents kitted out 4x4s to overland Africa. I remember correctly, Dan was our first non-rover owning guest on the show. And so now he's our first two-time non-rover owning guest. As always, thanks for your comments, follows, likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. The podcast is now available on YouTube under the account Center Steer Podcast. And be sure to subscribe through whatever means you listen to the podcast to have it automatically delivered when it is posted. You can also get in touch with us by leaving a voicemail through the website, record your comment or question, enter your name and email, and send it on in. If you've been following Oxford, enjoying our interviews with figures in the Overland and Land Rover community, liking our coverage of most things Land Rover, please consider supporting the show. You can be a regular podcast supporter through Patreon. You can be a one-time supporter through Buy Me a Tea or show off your support by purchasing a t-shirt or sticker. Visit our website, centersteer.com for all the details. If you are a business and interested in reaching the Land Rover community throughout North America and the rest of the world, there are sponsorship slots available on the podcast. The podcast averages over 600 downloads a month over the past year. And thank you to Commonwealth Classics for sponsoring the podcast for the last several years. And now for the news. Warning, there's Freelander content ahead. First up, JLR to cut production capacity by 25%. Automotive News reports that JLR is cutting down its manufacturing capacity by 25% within five years. This came from an investor presentation that took place at the end of February. The downsizing in production came from the previously announced projects that the brand will not complete. In line with this, JLR will be building a new architecture for pure EV vehicles that is exclusive to the brand and will underpin upcoming products. Despite this and the cut down in production capacity, JLR promised that it will retain its assembly plants in its home country and all over the world, all under the leadership of CEO Thierry Bellare. And along those same lines... 
JLR is going through a major transformation. Last month, Jaguar announced an ambitious plan to become an electric-only automaker from 2025. Land Rover will still offer combustion-powered models, but will launch as many as six electric variants within the next five years. As part of the company's new reimagined strategy, the all-electric Jaguar XJ has been canceled. This isn't the only new model JLR is axing, however. Automotive News Europe reports that the development of vehicles based on the flexible modular longitudinal architecture MLA platform supporting full electric, plug-in hybrid, and combustion engines has been canceled. As well as the electric XJ, this platform was going to underpin the rumored low-riding road rover, but the electric SUV is no longer being developed. The Jaguar J-Pace, a large luxury electric SUV that would have been Jaguar's answer to the BMW iX7, will also likely be scrapped. In the future, the MLA platform will be reserved for large Land Rover SUVs, including the Range Rover and Range Rover Sport. From 2025, smaller Land Rovers, such as the Evoque and the Discovery Sport, will use the new electric modular architectural platform. JLR's chief financial officer, Adrian Mardell, explained that the MLA mid program was canceled because the XJ and the electric Land Rover would not meet Jaguar's emissions and technology expectations. It's a costly decision as JLR will write off 1.4 million pounds of investment poured into the canceled XJ replacement and electric Land Rover. I, I guess they're they're killing off the Road Rover uh, because I mean the platform it was based on is being canceled and and they couldn't find a good way to make any other platform ugly enough. <laughs> At least we won't have to say Land Rover, Range Rover, Road Rover. <laughs> oh boy, yes, good. I'm right. sure they'll find a way to stack up names on something else. And I suspect that that platform, the MLA platform, couldn't support what Jaguar was thinking of doing with electric batteries because they were going to do it all in house. And now that they're going out of house, and you know, including someone else, looks like they're going to probably have to use you know throw out that whole that uh, that whole platform. Well, if you're dedicated to be fully be to being fully electric, you kind of don't want to start that on a on a multi-powered uh, platform, and, and something that's designed to be both electric and combustion kind of doesn't allow you to optimize for electric as well. Next up, a story that will shock no one who has been paying attention to reliability of JLR these low these past net number of years. JLR CEO says company loses over 100,000 sales each year over poor quality reputation. JLR CEO Terry Bollare has apparently heard every British car joke in the book as he estimates that the company's reputation for quality issues cost the company over 100,000 sales annually, reports Automotive News. Bollare was addressing investors in a call when he noted the elephant that wasn't in the room because said elephant was worried that a Jag might break down and be expensive to repair. <laughs> While Bellare noted that the company has made dramatic improvements lately in terms of reliability, he also made it crystal clear that the company needs to combat the company's bad rep for breakdowns. Quote, the dissatisfaction of our customers was really detrimental to our natural volume. The missed opportunities today are massive. It's more than 100,000 healthy sales that we could perform. Unquote. While Bellare also told investors that recorded incidents of dissatisfaction were at a record low with the current 2021 models, they still have a pretty uphill battle. Bellare, who would become JLR's CEO in September, made it clear that quality improvements were a key priority of his. One way they can quantify this is by looking at warranty costs, which go down as quality goes up. According to Automotive News, JLR's warranty costs over the past nine months of 2020 were $680 million, nearly half of what they were during the same chunk of 2019. <laughs> yes, I said $680 million in nine months of warranty costs. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that's only half the amount. <laughs> One factor that could help the company's reputation is its ambitious electrification goals. With Jaguar aiming to be fully electric by 2025 and Land Rover following suit in 2030, electric vehicles simply have fewer moving drivetrain parts to break. No one tell him about software glitches, though, or the fact that Tesla would have barely ranked above Jaguar, fourth from last, had its incomplete results counted in J.D. Power's dependability survey. And I question how many of the existing warranty issues are related to moving drivetrain parts versus other things that still are going to exist. Right. 
The newer Jaguar E-Pace SUV was the top-ranked small premium SUV in the JD Power Initial Quality Study, which is based on problems during the first 90 days of ownership. Brand by brand, they fared worse, with Land Rover second to last in the study, Jaguar sixth from the bottom. It's worth noting that the E-Pace is built by Austrian builder for hire, Magna Steyr. However, maybe JLR just needs to hire Magna Steyr for everything. <laughs> And worked for Benz and the G wagons. It, this has it, been a problem, though, sadly, with British manufacture going back to you know, the the British Leyland days. Oh yeah, you'd think that they could have they could get the work themselves out of it, but yeah. I'm I'm just amazed at how they revel at the bottom of the uh, reliability scales fifty years later. Right. I mean, it's no surprise that that they have issues, and I mean, nobody nobody's going to say that they, they hadn't heard that. But uh, what what I find interesting about this story is that now they're starting to quantify it in terms of how many sales they've lost. That's that to me is new. And warranty work, warranty. Costs well, work. yeah, warranty costs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's. I mean, that's, they've that been tracking and quantifying that already. It's just. Now they're publishing it as they talk about it. Right. But but how that translates into lost sales is is a relatively new wrinkle. And, and I mean, the warranty cost thing is one way to track it. As long as they don't start denying warranty in order to artificially drive their warranty cost down. I mean, that would right. be the concern if that's going to be their metric. Uh, that, that concerns me a little bit. Wouldn't be that hard to work out the hundred thousand i'm sure they ran a bunch of surveys in the united states and elsewhere right. where one of the questions was you know what brand what cars have you considered what what did you buy did you consider this why didn't you consider that and right. you could probably not too many questions work out the people that are you know would really love to get you know a new defender or an evoke or something like that but, but reputation they don't, but they don't just yeah, they proceeds don't they don't trust it. I, I will say the first question out of my friends who are not Land Rover people, it's, you know, after is that, you know, how's your Range Rover? It's always, hey, did it break down? So, you know, that, I think the general community, especially here in North America, has a negativity around it on reliability. Well, and they, they think it's funny to, to, to poke at the reliability of British stuff, whether it's deserved or not. It's the fun thing to do, apparently. Well, you are going back to reliability from the, you know, the, the end of the 60s and 70s. The the Marina was not the greatest vehicle out there at the time. Uh, well, no, and there were a whole lot of other British stuff that was right down there on that list alongside the Marina. I mean, reliability, yeah, it was a real problem in the in the in the the Leyland years definitely. So, I mean, they've earned the reputation. So now it's how to shred it. How to, right. to shed it. How do you unearn reputation that you spent a reputation you spent fifty years building is difficult to dismantle overnight? Well, six hundred million dollars to of of repairs. Like, I'm I know I, if 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 asked what would a company spend, I would not have even begin to have come up with a number. And now that I've heard a number, I'm I'm somewhat shocked that it's it's that high. You could spend a lot of R and D and doing things to improve it. You know even galvanize things as Audi does to reduce, you know, rust prefer, uh, perforation issues and make that warranty sound better. There's right. a lot that they could do to spend that money. It's, it's like being in debt and having to pay interest charges. You're right. You could spend that money on prevention as opposed to treatment. Well, the first way to fix something is to acknowledge it. And that sounds like what uh, Land Rover JLR is doing. Right. Acknowledge it and, and also try to assess the, the magnitude, the significance of it. Next up, a couple of car awards for the new Defenders. I guess this is some good publicity, some positivity. Uh, first up, the Land Rover Defender Car of the Year from whichcar.com. In the history of daunting tasks, reinventing the Land Rover Defender is surely only just behind repainting the Sistine Chapel ceiling and re-recording Abbey Road. <laughs> I, I like the entry to that. That was good. Yeah, more like wallpapering the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But And then uh, Land Rover Defender wins Women's World Car of the Year. The Land Rover Defender has won the top spot of the 2021 Women's Car of the Year, defeating nine other category winners to be named the Supreme winner. The overall winner was announced on International Women's Day on March 8th. The vehicles are driven and judged by a panel of 50 female auto riders in 38 countries over five continents. 
the quote, the women's world car of the year is the only jewelry in the world made up entirely of women motoring journalists, said Marta Garcia, executive president of women's world car of the year. Quote, this gives it enormous value because its decisions represent the liking and preferences of millions of women drivers around the globe, but cars have no gender and are not subject to stereotypes. So winners of these awards are quite simply the best cars in the world, unquote. And the Defender won it, I guess, because there were no Freelanders to give it to? Hey, no, hey, no. That is not the Freelander content I discussed. That is bonus Freelander content. It's bonus. <laughs> Land Rover launches Defender Above and Beyond Service Awards to honor U.S. organizations making a difference in their community. This is a Land Rover press release, but still uh, worth reading the details. Inspired by the endless acts of service across the U.S. from extraordinary citizens this past year, Land Rover today announced the launch of the Defender Above and Beyond Service Awards to celebrate U.S.-based charitable organizations that are making a positive impact in their community. To honor the 70-year history of the brand, Land Rover will award a specially outfitted Defender to seven organizations to help further their charitable efforts. Organizations must be U.S.-based 501c3 nonprofits whose efforts fall within the seven categories below. And these are the seven categories are, uh, and I'll read them because they're, I should also tell you they have different submission deadlines. So maybe what I'll do is I'll read you the categories and give you the submission deadlines for them. Search and Rescue, Coastal and Marine Conservation, and those submission deadlines close April 7th of 2021. Animal Welfare and First Responders, that closes on June 1st, 2021. And Environmental, Urban Improvement, and Fire Services, that's the last of the three categories, that closes on July 27th, 2021. Entrants can nominate a nonprofit charity or nonprofits can nominate themselves and submitting an up to three minute video that shares what your charity is about, how it addresses a need in your community, and how the Land Rover Defender will help to further your effort. All winners will be announced on September 2nd to 2021. Oh, once, oh, here we go. I should add this. Once selected by a panel of qualified judges, finalist videos will be posted on LandRoverUSA.com for public voting before submissions for the next category take place. And, And do the winners of each category win themselves a defender or is it a cash award? No, no, you get a you get a new brand new defender. They're they're going to okay. give away one per those seven categories. They're going to give okay. Away so seven so the winner total. of each category gets a defender. Okay, yes. good. That yes. was my question. Based on the picture, they get a drone because there's a drone in the uh, in the picture. Uh, I think the defender comes with a drone. Is that what it looks like to you? It, it, it was not clear in the in in the reading of this, but uh, it was a specially kitted out defender. It's very possible they did that with the. Uh, which was that the D5, the Red Cross or something like that? Uh, I, think I can't remember which the organization was, but they, yeah, they had a specially kitted out SVO version with a drone. Does that mean you can control the drone from the, the infotainment on the dash? <laughs> oh, that'd be cool. That would be. <laughs> I, I, there's no, actually probably almost no reason why you couldn't. The vehicle has over the air updates, so it has built in Wi Fi. It could potentially connect. Yeah, why not? A Land Rover launches writing competition for kids. Land Rover has teamed up with the creator of the Landy and Friends children's books to launch a competition for young storytellers. The winning writer will have their own scene illustrated in the next Landy books by Lamond herself. Author and illustrator Veronica Lamond has been creating her usually popular stories about Landy, the series one and Fender, the defender since 2010. So far, there are eight in the series. The seventh ha- having been commissioned by Land Rover to commemorate the end of defender production at Sully Hall in 2016. Unfortunately, the deadline has passed though for submissions. That was a uh, Thursday, the 25th of March, but I thought I'd let you know that's out there. Friend of the show, uh, Veronica Lamont, she's been on the podcast. It's, good. Yeah, it was, it's been a while. Maybe we should get her on again to talk about the, the, new, the new program. Volvo says it will only sell electric cars by 2030. Swedish automaker Volvo says it will only sell electric cars by 2030, phasing out all diesel, petrol, and hybrid options in an effort to reduce global carbon emissions. The company previously aimed for half of its car sales to be electric by 2025, but says the new strategy is an acceleration of this goal driven by strong demand for its electric options. The company also says future sales of its electric cars in coming years will be online only. And a reminder, Volvo is owned by the Chinese conglomerate Geely. 
will there be batteries available for all of this accelerated deployment of electric only vehicles? That's the interesting question. And if you haven't noticed yet, uh, I have added to the website a link for tracking when internal combustion engines are being banned by various organizations around the world. It's on the website. Mm-hmm. So you can track that. I'll hopefully by the time the podcast is up, I'll add Volvo to it. Is there a little countdown clock <laughs> on that page as well? <laughs> uh, Jeep branded charging stations coming to trailheads this spring for off-roaders and overlanders. Jeep has teamed up with Electrify America to create a network of charging stations targeting off-roaders and overlanders. The automaker announced the new Jeep 4XE charging network that will be rolled out at or close to trailheads of Jeep Badge of Honor trails over the coming year. Jeep said the stations will either be directly connected to the power grid or use solar power to generate electricity. The first sites will be open this spring at Moab, Utah, the Rubicon Trail in Pollock Pines, California, and Big Bear, California. While the stations will be open to vehicles from other brands, Jeep owners will be able to log on to unlock free charging at stations via a custom app. So all all makes of vehicles have equal access, but Jeeps are more equal than others. Yeah, very much like the, the Tesla charging stations. And I think that those are to go along with the... Um, I think they have a, an actual Jeep Wrangler 4XE, uh, which is a, a plug-in hybrid model. Right, which I don't think is out yet, actually. <laughs> but I think it's supposed to be in conjunction with it. Yeah. I think it paves the way for Jeep to become a, a more electrified brand. If the, the big objection people have, and including myself, is that, you know, there aren't that many places to recharge. So if Jeep can show we already have a network in place that we've already built out, now we're building the vehicle, it kind of, it helps them, I think. For sure. And having them at places where you can go off-road is actually ideal, because you can you can go on a pretty nice trail ride in electric only mode and still be able to get home or you know have somewhere to charge right. so you can return home or go camp for you know a night or two and take right, the trails right right and even if you if you don't have an electric vehicle you could probably use this to recharge your your uh, your cabin battery for running your your refrigerator and your other things if 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 need be yeah, the article does say Jeep doesn't sell any electric vehicles yet but they do have the Wrangler XE on XE on offer. The plug-in hybrid Wrangler starts at about $50,000, has a 12.3 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery that should deliver about 25 miles of range using level two charger. Level two charger, Jeep says a full recharge should take about two hours. Uh, X, uh, four XE is coming. I think it's actually already out. They just don't have a pure, pure electric vehicle yet. Uh, I understand now. Thank you. And review of the 2021 Land Rover Discovery P360R Dynamic of out of uh, Australia. I'll read some bits of this, not the whole thing. You can check out the whole one if you wish. Sorry to be cruel, but this generation of Discovery has long felt like Land Rover's piggy in the middle. That was true of the design of the visually pudgy three-row when it be launched in 2017. But more recently, it's become an equally appropriate description of the Disco's squeezed place in the model lineup, right between the rugged utility of the new Defender and the blingier bling and dynamic excitement of the senior Range Rovers. While a midlife facelift hasn't done much to alter the Disco's handsome but overweight design, it has brought more substantial changes under the skin and an all-new engine range that has reduced power plant selection to a binary choice. New motor, but new motors come from JLR's Ingenium family and incorporate 48 volt mild hybrid assistance with a P360, also getting an electric supercharger to improve low down response. Specification levels have been increased and simplified with air suspension and seven seats across three rows now standard. The facelift part of the facelift doesn't detain us for long. On the outside, there are new LED headlights and a gently revised radiator grille and an optional R-Dynamic visual pack adding gloss black details. Changes to the cabin are more obvious and with the welcome arrival of the Pivi Pro infotainment system running on an 11.4-inch dashboard touchscreen. Outgoing car's rotary gear selector has been replaced by a more conventional shift lever on this with the standard 8-speed auto gearbox. 
the Discovery's interior still reflects its likely role as a family bus with materials that seem to have been chosen for durability rather than show with no fewer than nine USB-C ports dotted around the cabin. The 2021 Lambert Discovery continues to offer an impressive combination of talents, but these revisions haven't done much to improve its case against its biggest rival, its newer, cooler sister. The Defender isn't quite as good on road and, and isn't usefully better off it, but it definitely is closer to Land Rover's values than seems to really turn buyers on. And the author says, I suspect the forthcoming three-row Defender 130 is going to make life for the Discovery even tougher. <laughs> and it falls on almost exactly the same from Car and Driver. This, uh, this is the American perspective. I'll try to read just a couple of salient points from this one so I don't have to read it all. But basically say same thing. New headlights, new new grill. They More substantial changes lie under the Disco's uh, hood. Both with the previous gas and diesel V6 engines have been dropped. The base powertrain is now JLR's 295 horsepower turbocharged 2-liter inline 4, which is standard on the entry-level P300S and R-Dynamic S models. A 355 horsepower turbo 3 liter inline six that also features 48 volt hybrid system is optional on the P360 R Dynamic S and standard on the top spec HSE. And base prices range from $55,000 for the S, $70,000 for the HSE, and the 360 R Dynamic S that they sampled at $63,250 American. Land Rover makes air springs standard in the Disco as they both bring a, a smooth, stately ride over every grade of asphalt and air-adjustable ride height for off-road use. The Disco's priorities are made clear by its terrain response system of drive modes, which feature one setting for road use and five for different types of off-road terrain. We didn't get to experience the newest setting. This is car and driver. The lack of a fordable river on our drive route prevented us from confirming Land Rover's claim that the Discovery's new wade mode allows it to navigate water crossings up to 35.4 inches deep. Although the Land Rover Discovery's latest updates struggle to enhance its curb appeal compared to its rivals, including the Jeep Wagoneer, the changes should make it more appealing to a broader set of buyers. And for the three-row shoppers that do value off-road prowess, the Discovery remains one of the most capable options, at least until Land Rover introduces its upcoming three-row Defender 130. There's your new Discovery 5. <laughs> Where is it going to be placed in the lineup when they come with the, the 130? And the whole reason for the Disco seems to have been, oh, we have three rows of seating. Well, now they're not the only players in that club. So we'll just, I mean, we'll just have to see what the sales numbers bring. They haven't really been good currently with the current Disco 5 here in the U.S. Well, just, yeah, just because it really doesn't look like a Disco. In some ways, I think the new Defender looks more like a Disco than the Disco looks like a Disco. They're clearly shooting for that sort of family bus vehicle. But, uh, you know, it, it seems like for their demographics, somebody's going to go for that Defender instead. It's at being that much cooler. Maybe here in the U.S. they should paint the Disco 5s bright yellow <laughs> if you want the whole bus thing. Or just put more soccer nets in them or something. <laughs> uh, it seems to me that they're just, a lot of their lineup just competes with themselves. They should be, you right. know, what's the what's the market niche that Audi or Jeep or someone else has that they're trying to go and compete against? Especially if you're going to have a one, as you said, the, the new Defender 130. They're going to compete against each other or against what? Range Rover Velar P400E 2021 UK review. Not even that long ago, merely the idea of the Range Rover Velar P400E would have been Land Rover lovers scratching their heads, possibly through to the bone. The new plug-in hybrid derivative has been introduced alongside a broader refresh of the Velar. Despite the fact that the model is only three years old, Updates are therefore light with the exterior gaining only new paint colors and wheel designs, which will do little to change the divisiveness of the Velar. It will remain concept car slick to many and a bit of a smooth off clown shoe of on wheels to others. Sorry to laugh. The interior receives more change and while it continues to major on woven fabrics as well as leather, if you like, you will now find a new steering wheel and gear selector along with updated touchscreens. The screens themselves are unchanged in terms of hardware, but they now use the PIVI Pro infotainment system. We've already experienced what the P400E powertrain has to offer because it is deployed in exactly the same specification as the updated Jaguar F-Pace, which with the Velar shares its D7A platform. The system integrates a 141 brake horsepower electric motor into the Velar's 8-speed transmission. 
That motor is fed by a 17.1 kilowatt hour battery pack beneath the boot floor and alone can take the Velar to 87 miles per hour. However, because the driveline only ever operates with full four-wheel drive, even solely under electric power, there's always an electric layer of mechanical drag, so EV range is rated at only 33 miles. Note also that on account of the battery pack, the P400E doesn't come with a spare tire, as do other range mates. There's more you can read about the Velar, but I pulled those parts out. Yeah, the reason for not having a spare tire is because they needed that needed that space to put batteries. And and also lighten the load just a just a little bit. No, they not lightening anything. They're taking the the you know 30 pounds of spare tire out and adding 500 pounds of batteries back in. So Land Rover Defender 90 D250 2021 UK review. JLR was extremely late to the party in launching this particular power plant, but the firm is due credit regardless because it has made a plenty sweet engine. Under the bonnet of the Defender 90, it doesn't sound quite as smooth or refined under lighter throttle loads than plenty of other straight six oil burners you could care to name, but it isn't that far off at all. Bury the throttle and you really get a sense of how much work the motor is having to do to shift the Defender's 2.2 ton mass and bluff boxy body with a bit of urgency. It's like you're accelerating on really soft, viscous asphalt. It's a little strange but impressive nonetheless. The ZF sourced 8-speed automatic gearbox isn't the most quick-witted in the world. Were this a conventional SUV, you would probably want it to be a bit quicker on the uptake, but the Defender isn't really a conventional SUV, is it? We've extensively covered just how capable the long wheelbase 110 version of this 4x4 is in the wilds, and while this one stayed firmly on the road during our brief test drive, the same story no doubt applies. In fact, the Defender 90 would be even better thanks to a superior breakover angle afforded by its shorter wheelbase. As for the interior, well, there's good space in both rows, although those in the back might feel a tiny bit short of headroom. The boot is very small, but that's the price you pay for those looks. And there's a little more there on the Defender 90 if you wish to read that. And on to future models, the 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Spy Shots. Land Rover has been spotted testing new prototypes of its redesigned Range Rover, the fifth generation of the nameplate. The new midsize luxury SUV is expected to debut alongside a redesigned version of the stretched Range Rover long wheelbase later this year, which means it will likely arrive as a 2022 model. A new Range Rover Sport should also be coming likely a year later. Compared to the current Range Rover, Land Rover's design team looks to have implemented a slightly less boxier shape for the redesigned model's cabin. The wheel arches also appear to be a bit more pronounced, and the new grille design can clearly be seen in the latest shots. So there's a new redesigned, slightly redesigned Range Rover coming, full-size Range Rover. And as we mentioned previously, the new Land Rover Defender 130 is coming. Car and Driver says Land Rover has confirmed the Defender 130 discussed during a call between investors and JLR chief financial officer in February. Automotive News quotes Mardell, the CFO, saying the Defender 130 will hit a sweet spot in North America, China, and the Middle East, which we're not yet touching. And a little more detail they give here. The Defender 130 is expected to seat seven in a body about 201 inches long, about the same overall length as the Cadillac Escalade and the GMC Yukon. The bigger Defender is targeted North America as well as China and Middle East. Other article I had here gave some more specifics. Based on internal documents from Land Rover, we can expect a Defender 130 to hit dealerships early next year. With the recent addition of a V8 Defender and plug-in hybrid variant, we expect even more niche models to diversify the appeal of the Defender. There are even rumors of a pickup truck version of the Defender based on the growing demand. And it seems like a great idea to us. This is Motor 1. The upcoming Defender 130 will be based on the current Defender 110 frame and add length to the rear of the SUV after the back axle rather than expand the SUV's wheelbase. This will allow Land Rover to cut the development and tooling costs required to build the new model. Just, it, it reminds me a bit of the uh, well, yeah, the GMC Yukon. They had the, the standard wheelbase was the Yukon, and then the, the big one, the, the Escalade fighter, was was the Yukon XL. Again, I, I, I think that Land Rover ought to go back to honesty in their wheelbases, and the 90 should be called the 102, and the 110 should be called the 119, and this should be the 190. Plus or the 110 plus if you want to stick to the names, but I, I don't know that it's really a 130 because it's no longer in wheelbase than the 110, and that was always been the hallmark was that it was a third wheelbase. Well, the number was an indication of what you were getting. Now it's 
It's marketing. Right. And, and I get that the 90 was never 90 inches. It was 92 and a bit, but it was, it was close. The, was 110, close. the, the 110 was 110. And, and the, uh, you know, the 109 was 109. And now the 130 was always 127 inches. But I mean, round up at least, it's not the same as a 110 just with extra overhang. And so that's kind of like they're breaking from tradition there. But when it comes to their marketing, I don't think they care anymore. I don't think they do. And I don't think the people that are there making those calls are, are really care about the tradition or that they even understand it. No, it's about sales and what they think will, will generate sales. Don't think the buyers who are buying this will care about the tradition either. Or understand it since they're after non-Land Rover people to become new Land Rover people. All right, moving on. Land Rover SVO boss hints at hardcore off-road version of the Defender V8. Land Rover is likely planning to build an even more hardcore version of its recently launched Defender V8, according to Australian car site, carsales.com.au. Michael van der Sand, the head of the company's special vehicle operations division, wouldn't outright confirm plans to build a Raptor fighting V8 Defender, but suggests an interview, the car is in the pipeline. Vandersan told carsales.com.au the reason the current Defender V8 wasn't given an SV or SVX badge, something that usually comes on the most expensive, highest performance Land Rover models, is because it hasn't had the correct amount of technical changes you would expect on an SV product. In addition to the 518 horsepower supercharged V8, the Defender V8 also gets retuned suspension, bigger brakes, and a slick yaw control traction system. When asked by carsales.com.au whether SVO would be developing a Defender V8 that would live up to the badge, Vandersand didn't outright confirm the vehicle, but told the website its 2019 purchase of Bowler, UK-based off-road performance specialist, uh, was very intentional. Well, I mean, if you really want to bulk the, the Defender up and make it a hardcore, that's the best way to do it. Just buy the guys who know how to do it and put them to work. And I suspect based on sales of the Defender, I suspect this will happen. They're, you know, they're, they can't sell them fast enough and why not soup it up and slap an SV badge on it? Of course. I'd, I'd, I would rather buy one of those than the, than the, the works V8 ones they're, they're talking about. I mean, if you're going to go for it, go for it. And that's news about current models. We're now going to hit a stretch of older Land Rover Heritage news. The oldest surviving Series 2 model has been fully restored. Land Rover's oldest surviving Series 2 model has been fully restored and is expected to sell for up to 22,000 pounds at auction. The original 1958 Land Rover Series 2 station wagon has been retained by Land Rover and was fully updated in 2011. The model is believed to be the oldest production Series 2 left in existence and was chassis 002 off the production line. The model features a range of unique features, such as a one-off heater and an early brake servo, a device for increasing a driver's pressure on the brake pedal. Originality is still part of the picture of the model, with the car retaining its original prototype engine and original registration number YOG306. Experts at Classic Car Auctions, who in ch- who are in charge of the selling the vehicle, gave the model a 101 out of 135 score in its overall condition report. Classic Car Auctions said YOG 306 was built on the 24th of March 1958 and dispatched on the 27th to the engineering department at Land Rover. The vehicle has been researched and discussed in detail with uh, S2 club members and has unique features, as we mentioned above. On closer inspection, the bodywork appears to be all original, and the addition of a station wagon hardtop has been fitted post-dispatch and fitted out inside as a station wagon and painted limestone. It was built as an export model, full tilt in bronze green. You can see the carefully filled in holes along the top of the original windscreen frame where the hooks for the tilt would have been. It is assumed that this conversion work was carried out at the factory. Tilt is another term for top, for canvas top. So, soft top, yeah. Soft top. Soft top. So that's your Series 2, 1958 Series 2. You can own one for, oh, um, sounds like maybe 22,000 pounds. I would say that that is a highly conservative number looking at the price of what some of these things have uh, sold for. Yeah, that doesn't seem like enough. Right. No. And it's a good looking vehicle. I would guess over 50 at some of the uh, the prices that have at least over on bring a trailer and some of the other places wow. in series ones and so on in the UK, like it should get more than 22,000 pounds. We'll see what it gets. Yeah. Bring a trailer. I don't think is the most reliable source of, of oh, valuations. 
<laughs> oh, that's a whole different discussion, yeah, that's, and we could go yeah. on a massive tangent there. Oh, especially absolutely. Especially if you're looking really at good. a recent P38 price that's on there. No, there have been a lot of recent prices that we could talk about, and and yeah, let's not though. Let's 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 have a different podcast for that. Just to say that twenty two thousand pounds for the the earliest or first series two, there's something for someone's collection. I've got the first right. one. That 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 brings a premium right there. It's you know the fact that it's first first one. Do you know what chassis number yours is, Dixon? You have a fifty eight. Uh two hundred and something. So yours should be worth about twenty two thousand pounds, also, right? <laughs> not in its current state <laughs> well i think it'd be more worth more at least to dixon if it were in canada that would be very true too a 1981 land rover 6x6 pickup truck is old school awesome a relatively small british company offered 6x6 conversions of the land rover back in the 1980s Townley Cross Country Vehicles is the name of that company, and the pickup before your eyes is one of their creations. And there's a picture of a green 6x6 listed for sale by the Land Rover Center in Huddersfield. The 1981 Land Rover 109 Series 3 Stage 1 V8 was registered for road use in May of 1986. One of two Townley 6x6 conversions, the sport utility truck was first owned by a gentleman who used it for towing a concrete pump and carrying pipes. The second owner acquired it sometime in 1995, sold it, then repurchased the SUT in 2005. <laughs> There's a couple things to pause on there for. One, SUT, sport utility truck. Second is you buy it and then you turn around and you want it back. <laughs> well, he, he, he came up with some more important things that he needed it for. From 2016 to 2018, the pickup underwent a restoration that saw almost everything rebuilt or replaced, including the bulkhead, the rear wings. Now riding on a galvanized chassis, the Landy features 30 more inches of wheelbase over the standard 109 inches. Rated at 2,000 kilograms, 4,400 pounds in terms of payload capacity, the Townley 6x6 can be switched from 4x6 to 6x6 on the fly. This capable workhorse is rocking an OHV aluminum V8, with 3.5 liters of displacement, the venerable Rover V8 with 91 horsepower, 166 pound-feet of torque. Fed by twin Zenith Stromberg carburetors and an electric fuel pump, the motor is connected to a four-speed manual transmission, a pair of transfer boxes, 3.54 gearing for all three axles, and servo-assisted drum brakes on all six corners <laughs> will also need to be mentioned. And yes, that is six corners. Along with a ground clearance of 8.25 inches, uh, for reference, the all-new Defender with air suspension and unibody chassis has 11.5 inches. If you intend to make this six-wheel blast from the past your own, prepare to pony up 39,995 pounds sterling or $55,000 at current exchange rates. That's your Townley 6x6. 17,000 pounds more for a 6x6 versus the first Series 2. Interesting for, you know, on what people would value is, is more interesting. I guess the anoraks like me would rather have the the series too. Yeah, the question is how the collectors are going to feel. I mean, the, the the six by six is cool, and you could actually, I mean, people might actually want to try and use that for something. Whereas the the series two is just going to be in somebody's collection. It's just that simple. That's probably what will happen to it. Yes, but depends who owns it. Right. But I mean, everything's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So we just mm -hmm. have to see how it all shakes out. And the series two has more, at least from the sound of it, more originality going for it. Whereas it sounds like this six by six has had quite a, quite a bit replaced. Well, I mean, it was a working truck. It was, it was built with the six wheel conversion to do some pretty serious work. So, you know, it got, it got beat on a good bit. So they probably had some stuff done. But yeah, they, they both have their merits and their uniqueness. So you don't see six by six too often, especially in a series three. Aren't that many stage one V8s either. We've now arrived at Freelander content. Rally Freelander extends BXCC trophy 2021. The Britpart British Cross Country Championship caters for 13 classes of vehicles, so all Land Rover owners can all Land Rovers can participate whether only slightly modified like our Rally Freelander or a highly customized prototype. Combining rough terrain with faster sections, the BXCC combines elements of stage rallies and hill rallies at various venues across Wales and England. Land Rovers or vehicles based on them are a common sight. 
competing for the trophy in the standard production class will be a father and son team, Reese, 20, Sean, 51, Matheson, and a former class-winning 1.8-liter Freelander 1, previously owned and converted by Mike Wilson and bought by the Mathesons in 2020. This car has been consistently earning its place on podiums since 2016. The first two rounds of the 2021 BXCC were canceled due to COVID, but the remaining four weekends in the series are expected to go ahead starting in mid-June in North Wales. The 2004 Freelander, with its 1.8-liter K-series engine, has received only minor modifications for the 2021 season. Limiting test opportunities due to COVID means recent Sean has spent more time modifying it than driving it. The car has 25-millimeter lift, with camber adjustment of 14 millimeters enabled by power flex camber adjustment bolts. Refurbished engine and sump guards have been fitted and the exhaust has a custom made back box by Glacier Leaper. In addition to the internal roll cage, Reese and Sean have also fitted new seat rails and a Terra Trip professional intercom kit integrated into their helmets. That is your mighty Freelander out on the cross country circuit. If it's still under warranty, that goes and explains away a lot of the six hundred million dollars that Land Rover is spending on warranty claims. So what you're what you're saying here, Dixon, is <laughs> well, that is the majority it is a Freelander that the majority of Land Rover's warranty claims are down to one vehicle. Well, it would well, be, be the last yeah. one. No, we know of two or three Freelanders that still exist in North America that are moving. But, but are they are they being driven? I, I, people send me photos or of them. They, they, or have on they, the highway. have they given up on trying to make the run? <laughs> That's a whole different issue. But this 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 gives hope to John's Freelander. There's one still running. No, there's in no competition. No, no, Dixon. There's no hope for that Freelander. I'm sorry. There is no. I would need Bezos money to to get that back to, <laughs> to where it needs to be. <laughs> So, so, so this this rally is being sponsored by Britpart. I guess that means the trophy comes in a in a blue box, and you may have to trim it a little bit to get it to fit on your trophy shelf. <laughs> and finally, while we try to connect with the folks in New Zealand, we'll have to make do with a video that was posted about Oxford in New Zealand. There's a video. It's a nine minute forty one seconds. Oxford in Hawks Bay, New Zealand, and the car has been traveling around New Zealand and. This channel is by 1 to 10 World. We'll, of course, have a link in the show notes to the video, but you want to check it out. They are using Oxford as it's intended. It is on the trail. It is going through water crossings and on the mountains of New Zealand with some spectacular scenery. It's really cool. <laughs> it's t- worth your time. Worth your time. What it actually is also worth your time is first video of a series that's been posted up to YouTube of Oxford in America of the start of its journey and where it some of the initial places that it went that's probably a worthwhile view too that yes david short has posted oxford starting his oxford in america series and posting those videos uh, on the rove channel as a matter of fact uh, harold and i just talked to david for the next uh, one of the next installments on Oxford and Pittsburgh. And which reminds me too, because David let me know about this and for all our listeners, if there's a, you may recall, David talked about Motor Week, uh, the PBS television show about vehicles doing a segment on Oxford. Well, that is going to air here in North in America. I'm not sure about North, North America. The segment will air in episode 4031, which starts showing on US PBS stations on Saturday, April 10th. It will be available on YouTube on the 12th and run for the entire week on PBS. Then it will air again on the following week on the Motor Trend Network. And we'll have a link in the show notes to track down your local PBS station to see if it's available. Uh, Hopefully it has a link to the YouTube channel also. Harold, you're probably going to say something about the local PBS station. I hope you're able to post a link to the YouTube because our local PBS station doesn't play Motor Week. So I'm going to have to look on YouTube. Indeed. Yeah. Check out the YouTube channel. I, I, my guess is they'll probably broadcast it you know, like the first day. And then after that, it'll be available to, again, we'll have links in the show notes. But that is, uh, you want Motor Week episode 4031 will include the Oxford segment. And that's the news for March 2021. Now making his triumphant return to the podcast is Dan Greck of The Road Chose Me. Welcome back, Dan. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me again. You are 
uh, traveling the world in a in a jeep. And we you know we have no hate here, so it's all all good stuff. And you were back on the you were originally on the show on uh, uh, twenty eighteen. I think it was our September show. It was uh, episode number sixty six, and we called it "Hey, it's that guy." <laughs> So, hey, it's that guy. He's back. <laughs> hey, it's still that guy. <laughs> well, Where'd he go. go away, please? <laughs> so you, you've you been traveling Africa um, in, in a Jeep, and you've written now a second book, which is uh, called The Road Chose Me, Volume 2, Three Years and 54,000 Miles Around Africa. Although we'll get that in just a moment, but where are you right now, just to set the stage? I am in Canada right now, um, in the West, over sort of near Vancouver. And I guess you're very nice. You're you're not traveling. <laughs> you're not yeah. traveling. No, I, I don't really want to live in a Jeep in the Canadian winter. Not much fun. So so are you in BC then or are you back in the yeah. Yukon where you were? In BC now. Uh, mm-hmm. I after I got back from Africa, I was too afraid to drive up to the Yukon in December. So I decided that I mm. better spend time in BC instead. There's your Australian showing. Exactly. After Africa, it came back with a vengeance. So now I'm, I just love the warmer weather and minus 40 can stay where minus 40 is. Yeah, I hear you. At that point, centigrade Celsius doesn't matter. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's cold. It's actually the same. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, minus somewhere. 40, it is, it is equal. Is that what it is? I minus 40 is minus 40, no matter what system you're using. So the road chose me volume two. What does that encompass? What's uh, of your journey of Africa? So this is kind of the whole trip woe to go from like when I was dreaming about it, going to work every day, trying to save money, building the Jeep and all the trials and tribulations, shipping the vehicle, and then the whole adventure all the way around the continent. But it's more also than just the adventures. I also wanted to document what I learned about Africa about the amazing people, the politics, kind of how we in the rest of the world see Africa. And then it it was always really strange to me. I'd be on the ground and I'm like, this is nothing like what people told me it was going to be like, or, you know, I I consider myself pretty well educated and pretty well read, but it was just vastly different. And I was like, this isn't at all what people kind of told me it was going to be like. So yeah, there's all of that as well as the adventures, you know, crossing the Congo, getting stuck in the mud, rolling the Jeep, kind of all the stuff. Well, that's the price of admission for an overlanding book. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 the getting stuck and the breakdowns, that you got to have that. Yeah, because you have to earn the good times, have to, right. uh, you know, you have to go through the hardships as well. Right. That's the compulsory part of the program. So the first book covered... The first book was uh, an entirely separate journey. That was my Alaska to Argentina drive uh, through the Americas for two years. And then, so that's, you know, book number one, trip number one. So now book number two, trip number two. And the seven or eight years between the two trips is also covered at the beginning of the, the second book. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I gloss over it briefly because more or less I was just going to work every day to save money. You're sitting at a desk. It doesn't need too much time in a book. Right. Yeah. That's kind of the the short version of it is like, yep, I I had to go to work and I'm glad that it's over. Well, you had to make some money, right? Pay for the Mm -hmm. trip. Exactly. Tell us about the Jeep, year, make, model, and what what did you do to it to for overlanding? Yeah, this Jeep I spec'd out to take around Africa. Uh, it's a four-door Wrangler Rubicon uh, 2011, so it has a 3.8-litre gas engine. And I knew all along, it, it's a pretty capable vehicle in stock form. You know, it has front and rear diff locks. Uh, it has super low-range transfer case. So in terms of off-roading, I really didn't need to, you know, beef it up at all. What I did want, though, was a lot more creature comforts. So I knew I'd be spending years on the road, so I really wanted a nice place to sleep. Uh, So I added a pop-up roof. It's kind of a little bit like a Westphalia where you end up with like this upstairs area. Or or an expander cab for the rover folks out there. Yeah, yeah. Or even a lot of the the sliding options now that exist for pickup trucks, like go fast campers and and all of those. It's similar to that. I also, you know, I added a fridge, a drinking water tank and filtration system. I've got a little kitchen in the back where I cook all my meals. Um, So it's, it was mostly the build was about all the creature comforts and, you know, lock boxes to store all of my cameras and kind of cabinetry for all of my clothes and gear and, and all those kinds of things. Tell us, tell us about the Africa trip and, and where, where did it start? Where did you end up? Right. So I built the Jeep here in Canada uh, and in the US. And then I drove across to the East Coast and I shipped my Jeep to Belgium in Europe, mostly just because that was kind of the cheapest and easiest option. 
Um, and I figured it'd be easier to ship into Europe versus Africa where you're going to just deal with a nightmare of bureaucracy. But it was super expensive to hang out in Europe and, and I needed to hurry up and get to Africa. So I drove double quick time through Belgium, France and Spain. And then there's a ferry from southern Spain into Morocco, which is in northwest Africa. And so that was where it all began. And basically then I followed the coastline all the way around Africa. So I went all the way down the West Coast through about 16 countries, including all the notorious ones like Nigeria, the Congo, Angola, Mali, Cameroon, jungles, deserts, mountains, rivers, lakes, mud, mosquitoes, malaria, more mud, all the way down to Cape Town. More malaria. More malaria, that's right. And then in Southern Africa is really like the, the kind of the pristine, beautiful, amazing for overlanding, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa. You can just roam wild, camp out where there's elephants and giraffes and it's super wide open and, and cheap and really safe and really friendly. So I spent nearly a year down in Southern Africa and then kind of regrouped, re-geared and then drove all the way up the East Coast, all the way through Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Sudan, into Egypt. And then the trip finished. I drove the Jeep into a shipping container in Egypt and I shipped it back to Canada. You didn't stay in the shipping container? No, they wouldn't let me. Uh, it, it might've been cheaper than flying, but uh, uh, they're pretty strict <laughs> on that stuff, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think that if those containers are airtight like they're supposed to be, you better hope that ship's on time if you're in there. <laughs> That's a good point. So you're circumnavigating in an anti-clockwise or counterclockwise uh, way around the uh, around a- Africa. Uh, you rolled the Jeep. I want to hear about that story. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was a very embarrassing and very um, terrifying thing. I've I've never been involved in a vehicle rollover before. Always uh, the highlight of any trip. And it was funny, you know, I, I was about probably three quarters of the way through the trip and, and not sure. that I was getting uh-huh. cocky, but I guess I was getting cocky. And you let your like, guard down. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I got this, you know, I'm, I'm tough. I'm good. And so I was in Uganda, um, getting close to Lake Albert, this sort of beautiful wilderness region. And I crested a hill and big Lake Albert is stretching out below me. And it's a great spot for a photo. And so I parked the Jeep on a hill and the parking brake has not functioned basically since I bought the Jeep. And I knew this, and so I'm somebody always... Give, somebody give you the optional Land Rover handbrake in this Jeep? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Jeep copied Land Rover's design. Maybe that's what happened. <laughs> and so parked it on a hill, left it in first gear. It is a, a manual transmission. So, you know, I turn the engine off, and I usually I sit in the driver's seat for 10 seconds just to see if it's going to move at all and while I'm getting my camera and maybe a drink of water. And it didn't budge. It wasn't a very steep hill. So I thought, oh, you know, this is fine. Uh I jumped out and I walked about 30 or 40 yards away from the Jeep. And as I turn around to take a photo, it starts rolling. So it actually, because it's so heavy, it can actually overcome engine compression. And so it's moving. Especially when the engine's warm and, and a little bit easier rolling over. That's a good point. I never thought of that. And so it starts rolling and I ran to no avail whatsoever. It probably covered about five or eight car lengths in the first few seconds. And so it was hopeless. And I just watched as it careened down. I don't know how far it went, maybe 20 car lengths, crashed into a rock wall and that, you know, on the driver's side. And so then that kicked it over onto the passenger side and it came to kind of a grinding, skidding halt on this like rocky road in the middle of nowhere in Uganda. And I was terrified. I basically crumpled to the ground and just did not want to believe what my eyes had seen and was like, no way at all. I want a mulligan. That's, that's not fair. I want, I want to do that over again. So the good news is you weren't in the vehicle when it rolled. Which, I mean, yeah, it is really good news. You know, no one was injured, which is great. But it's also fraction sitting here today. It's, it's fractionally disappointing because now I have to say, well, yeah, I rolled my Jeep and I wasn't even in it. How bad was the Jeep damaged? You know, at first I was terrified that, that you know, the, the fiberglass pop-up roof was all caved in and I imagined smashed windows. Um, and so a few friendly locals showed up and they pushed on the side and I winched to a tree. And, and after about half an hour, it just bounced back up on its wheels. It actually wasn't that big of an ordeal. And I was amazed. I mean, the, the, the fender flares had been torn off and there was dints and scratches on the doors and whatever, but no broken glass, no damage, significant And actually, I duct taped the fender flares back on, uh, and I've been driving it ever since. Nothing at all, you know, mattered. So Tape and all, still driving it? Tape and all, still driving it, yeah. Right on. 
Um, so, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I got away with like a 0.1. So I'm extremely lucky. Considering how far you've traveled and how long that's, uh, that's pretty good. That is. And if I remember correctly, you have a, a YouTube video covering that. I do. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, I don't actually have the role itself on video, but when it happened, I guess my GoPro turned on by itself. And so partway through the extra, the, the writing process, I pick it up off the passenger floor. Uh, and it's pretty raw because I'm pretty scared. And so I just filmed kind of my reaction. Where can one find that uh, YouTube video? Uh, my channel is called The Road Chose Me. And the video, I think, is called Disaster in Uganda, if I remember correctly. So th was that the worst that happened as far as uh, any close calls? Uh, that was the worst vehicle thing that happened. Oh, oh, oh okay, <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> this yeah. is Africa, after all. <laughs> this is Africa, and, and I did go there, you know, expecting to have a massive adventure. And I think part of that is you have to sort of embrace the uncertainty or embrace the idea that like things are not going to go to plan, but to some degree, that's the idea. Like if, if I wanted, you know, sort of an easy regimented life, I would just stay here in Canada. So I'd been in Africa maybe four months and I was in Mali and malaria presents a big problem on a long trip because the medication you can take to try and prevent malaria, it can be really hard on your liver if you take it for too long. And so doctors all recommend you shouldn't take it for more than about six months. So I just couldn't take it. It was going to be too bad for me. So inevitably, I got bitten by mosquitoes. And inevitably, I did get malaria when I was in Mali. And it was bad. I was down and out for sort of two or three days. I felt, you know, like a really, really bad cold or flu. Um, but all things considered, I was like, oh, I guess it was bad. But, you know, there, there's a medicine you can take that helps you get over it. And Sort of a week later, I was like, oh, whatever, no big deal. Yeah, and the hardcores course, carry, a, carry a course of that medicine with them at all times so that when they do get it, they, they're they prepared. That's right. And I learned that lesson and I did start carrying it from then on. And I even carried the injectable version, which is much stronger. Um, Ooh. And of course, Africa being Africa, I guess it still needed to teach me that lesson. And so later on the trip, when I was in Angola, I'd just come out of the Congo. Uh, I got malaria again and it was... It was the strangest thing because I, it was in the morning and I was driving along and I just started to feel off. And I was traveling with some friends at the time in their vehicle. So we stopped to camp for the day and it was only maybe like midday. And I said to them, I'm pretty sure I have malaria again. And they were like, no, don't be stupid, Dan. And I said, oh, I, I know exactly what this feels like. I hate to admit it, but I have malaria again. That's the experience so, talking there. And, and it's sort of hard to describe what it feels like, but once you feel it, you just know. And so I took the prevention or the, the fix it up medicine and they started injecting me in the backside twice a day. And I basically did not walk, talk, sleep, eat or drink for five days. Um, I lost 20 pounds in five days. Wow. It was, it was bad. That's, bad. That's a hell of a diet plan capital letters bad and they actually were at the point where they said if, if i wasn't improved the next day they were just going to load me into their vehicle and try to get me to a hospital not not recommended try not to get malaria when you go to africa so you have a we have close call with a vehicle close call with your health how about some highlights what's what's a what's a good thing like what's the is there one memory of the trip that stands out for you is like the highlight moment i'm sure you have several thousand but i'm gonna i'm gonna make you pick one or two or three. pick one yeah there you go Several thousand for sure, but they all or many of them have a very recurring theme and it just is the extreme kind, kindness and friendliness of the local people. Everywhere that I went, regardless of the country, regardless of the language barrier, for no reason at all, people would just welcome me. They would shake my hand. They would offer me food and water or they would, you know, I'd kind of drive into this little village at dusk and you know, and it, it's getting dark and you're kind of a bit afraid and you think, you know, oh, have I done a bad thing here? Like, am I in trouble? And people would just come over and even in two words of English, they would say like, welcome, welcome. You, you camp here. Yes, very good. And, you know, I'm like right next to their mud hut and they're like trying to show me their children. And it just because people in Africa are friendly, that's what they weren't expecting money. They weren't asking anything in return just because they're so welcoming and so friendly. And, and there were quite a few times it was, it was really overwhelming emotionally. You know, I'm this white guy and I'm driving a big four wheel drive and I kind of could be threatening. And they just treated me like one of their family members purely because that's how nice they are. And, and that happened thousands of times in, in every country. Like it was, it was amazing. 
I wonder if the handshaking ritual has changed any because of COVID. Yeah, I that, was a, that was a recurring theme in your book. Everywhere you went, it was all about the handshaking. That's right. Yeah, I really wonder. Hmm. When when did you return from the trip? When when did it conclude? You know, timing wise. Yeah, I shipped the Jeep out in March of 2019. So it's been two years ago, actually. Today, I left Egypt. Curious how close to uh, how close to COVID. <laughs> Yeah, I I did pretty well. I was yeah, you I missed was well it by back. a year. Good for you. Yeah, that's right. I was well back and didn't get stranded, whereas a lot of overlanders around the world yeah. got stuck in various it's countries. Really, a good thing you didn't need an extra year to save up the money for the trip. Exactly right. I, I try to remind myself the best time to go is always now. It isn't you know in a year from now when things look better. It's yeah. try try to get moving now because you don't know what's going to happen later. Although interestingly, the bells were. I guess kind of lucky they'd return back to South uh, South Africa and yeah they got lucky because they just happened to be in South Africa when they went all locked down so they were home yeah that's right I couldn't imagine what would have happened if you were in Nigeria or like Gabon or something that would be incredibly difficult to deal with some country with a, with an unextendable thirty day visa <laughs> exactly for right yeah and no negotiating yeah. In general, the visas, especially in West Africa, they are very difficult to get. A lot of countries, they just aren't used to tourists. They don't really understand the concept. And then even when you're in the country, it can be very difficult and stressful if you would need to extend your visa or kind of make any alterations to your timeline. And it becomes this really strange thing where I call it, you're a bit locked into a roller coaster because you can go to one embassy and let's say get a visa for a country that's like four countries away but that's the only time you'll be able to get the visa. As you get closer, the embassies won't give you one because they just don't want to deal with tourists. So what that means is when you're getting the visa, it's in your passport, you must enter on this date and you must leave on this date. So that means in the next few months, as you're trying to get there, you know, you're know you crossing who knows what countries with what political situations and the rainy season and mud and vehicle breakdowns and who even knows, it doesn't matter. You will arrive at the border on this date and then everything else is secondary. Yeah, not before and not after. Exactly. Yeah. And so it all you it miss becomes, it by a day too bad. Yeah. It becomes this big, like locked in roller coaster where you're like, Oh, well, I guess I'm just going to put in a few 12 hour driving days and see what happens. Yeah. The African government seem to be very proud of their bureaucracy. Very, very much. Yeah. It's a real priority there. Is there a country that's more open or countries that are more open to tourists and encouraging that that makes it easier? Oh, definitely. All of Southern Africa. So the, the ones I mentioned earlier, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe to a lesser degree, Zambia, even Tanzania and Kenya. There are tens of thousands of tourists at any given time roaming around all over the place. And many of them have their own vehicle. Many of them have rented a vehicle or they're on like a guided tour, but there are a lot of tourists getting around. And I guess on the opposite side, what countries are more challenging that maybe someone might want to either avoid or, or just be prepared for? Definitely Nigeria would top that list. It yeah, is, that's one of the hardest ones to get into from what I've seen. It is on, very on, hard on to get the visa. visa. Standpoint, yeah. That's right. And then it is, it's a country where bad things can happen. It's very, very dense and fast and loud and crowded. Um, and so I did meet some people who kind of dealt with a bit of violence in Nigeria. The Congo also is very, very difficult to get a visa for and to drive across. The roads are just so bad. It's, it's difficult to do. Um, and then on the other coast, Sudan was quite challenging. And Ethiopia at the time was even more challenging to deal with kind of the safety situation. There was some infighting. And, and right now, actually, the bells are really struggling. They can't get in or out of Ethiopia because of basically a civil war that's broken out. Yeah, is that, the, is that the country that it's nice in the middle, but anywhere near the border, it's dangerous? That's exactly right. Yeah. And it, it's kind of interesting because Ethiopia borders Sudan and, and getting from Ethiopia to Sudan is really difficult. And everyone always assumes that's a Sudan thing, but actually that's not true at all. From the second I drove into Sudan, I was felt immensely safe and people were friendly and welcoming and it was no problem. It's all to do with near the borders of Ethiopia the local Ethiopians are actually fighting the government because they don't like some things that the government is doing. Congo, is that the Democratic Republic of Congo? That's the country in the middle? That's right. Yeah, that's the big challenging one that really... I don't. I, I see on your map, your journey does not go into Congo. No, and, and so there's that epic thread, if you've ever read it on Expedition Portal, 
where two, uh, a French couple or a Belgium couple, they drive from the east of the Congo to the west of the Congo. And it takes them a month and it is unbelievable. They actually abandon their vehicle at one point and it's probably the most epic overland journey ever documented. Um, and so part of me is extraordinarily curious and excited to attempt something like that. But at least 50% of me is just downright terrified. The Congo is a very, very wild place and bad things do happen for sure. And you're traveling on your own, right? Mostly, yep. That's an, that's an adventure on its own yeah, right there. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, pros and cons. Usually there's nobody to argue with. Right. But then, of course, that's a bad uh, thing as well when there's yeah. no one to blame when things I can argue wrong. with myself just fine. <laughs> yeah, that's and, right. And there's no one to help you write the vehicle when it, uh, when it rolls over. Hope, hope the locals help you out. That's right. You do well, end up relying on locals a lot more. It seems to me there's plenty of locals to be found. Or, or they, they will find you without any effort, from what I, I gathered. Yeah, that's right. Basically, if there is a road going somewhere, there will be people living reasonably close to that road. And so even when you've driven out a few hundred miles and you're really, really far away, sooner or later, someone will show up. You're like, where did you come from? How, how is that possible? But yeah, people just, they live all over the place. So what's the wildlife you mentioned, uh, you know, you were among elephants and I assume lions and other such things. What's it like on actually on the ground? Is there, are you really amongst the wildlife or is it more like the Western world where there are, you know, fences and controlled areas? And Yeah, it, it varies greatly by country. Um, lots of countries don't even really have big wildlife anymore. It was all hunted to extinction. And then many countries like South Africa, for example, it does have immense wildlife areas and national parks and wilderness reserves. But for the most part, they are fenced. And so it's pretty unlikely you'd see something like an elephant unless you were in one of these enormous national parks. But then just neighboring in Namibia, I actually, I picked a friend up at the airport in the capital city of Namibia. So it's an international airport. And I said, I guarantee you we'll see wild elephants today. And so like an hour from the city, we're just driving along a dirt track, no fences, no national park. We're just, you know, kind of like, uh, BLM land in the U S we're just out in the wilderness and right there is a herd of elephants and you can get, I mean, you could drive right next to them if you really wanted to. And same thing with, you know, zebras, giraffes, lions, Gemsbok, everything you've ever dreamed of is just out there and it's unbelievable wilderness. Yeah. And so you basically load up all the gas and water and food you can carry drive out into these wilderness areas and then just hang out there for two weeks. And some days maybe you don't drive at all and you just watch the elephants wander by. And then some days maybe, you know, you drive a hundred miles, find another beautiful spot and be like, oh, I'm going to camp here next to this dry riverbed and see what wanders by. Absolutely jaw dropping. It sounds amazing. We it's had hard the, to believe. We had the Lizzie bus people on uh, a couple of years ago and they were talking about camping and, and they had the, uh, the tent on top of their truck and they, they would talk about waking up in the morning and there would be a giraffe looking in the window at them. Totally, totally. And it's, it's the strangest feeling. Even I remember sitting around a campfire and like hearing a lion roar and it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up and it is terrifying. I think I climbed upstairs into bed yeah. in about half a second flat. I'd, I'd be looking for my keys about then. It's kind of weird, though, how it almost becomes normal and it's just part of everyday life. Do the animals approach you? Are they used to humans and vehicles or do they pretty much leave you alone? I, I imagine there's probably some animals a little more maybe tame that come looking for water or food. Yeah, I think for the most part, they're sort of used to vehicles enough that they, they don't scatter immediately, but they sort of slowly move off. They're like, ah, we don't want to deal with this. We'll just kind of meander away. You're not, you're not a risk yet. <laughs> no, no, but I was in, I was in one national park in Zimbabwe where the hyenas are especially uh, confident. And so sitting around a campfire, you know, you're facing the fire you turn around and there's a hyena, maybe like six feet away from you, like stalking up. Wow. And, uh, and hyenas are like, evil looking creatures they are not pleasant to look at they just they just look evil and they're up to no good and so they can game. they can be mean if they want to be so like you know a big wild dog they would they would give right. you a really nasty bite 
but uh, I don't think it really happens. It would be very, very rare for that to actually happen. Well, I guess, you know, here in North America, we have to worry about bears. So it's probably, there's probably something, not, not that hyenas are like bears, but I'm talking about the, just the risk of wildlife while you're out. That's right. Yeah. And you, you do have to be mindful of elephants. There, there was a lot of national parks where they won't let you drive in if you're carrying citrus at all. They say, even if you've got an orange inside your fridge, inside your vehicle, an elephant will destroy your vehicle to get that orange out. They, like bears. They just love oranges so much, they're notorious for it. And so the, the National Park guys always just say like, trust us, you, you don't want to break this rule because it's only going to end in tears for you. <laughs> Their sense of smell is that good. It can go oh, yeah. through several layers of sealed containers. Wow. Yeah, that's right. And of course, they're so huge and so strong, you know, like yeah. smashing a window and tearing a door off a car is irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just yeah. something to do. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, as you said, Harold, just like kind of like bears, I guess, except probably. Well, yeah, I mean, bears, I mean, bears will shred your tent just to lick the chapstick off your lips. If you, if you put some on before you go to bed. Yeah. They just love anything that smells kind of like different or strongly. And right. So, I guess so they're don't, curious. don't, don't put on your, uh, your bacon lip gloss before you go to bed. <laughs> Leave the Axe body spray at home. And don't, don't take donuts. Apparently they like the sweets too. So it's... Uh, well, they, they... they like anything edible, really. So don't take a snack to bed. Make sure it's all locked up in a, in a steel box. And you also put it on a put on a rope and you put it six feet up a, a tree, you know, you to well, get it off six. the ground. Or... Six, more like 26. And it needs to be at least the height of the tree up, away from the tree. There's a good reason to use your winch. Yeah, you yeah you stretch it on a line between the two trees, and then you got to watch out for what they call kamikaze bears who will climb the tree and leap out upon the rope to drag the bag down. <laughs> so what about hippos? I hear hippopotamus are pretty nasty creatures. Did you encounter any of them? Oh, yeah, plenty of hippos. Basically, whenever you're near a decent-sized body of water, you can assume there are hippos and probably crocodiles too. And hippos, they spend their whole day in the water and they really they feel safe there and they won't bother you unless, you know, you swam out there. But if you're on the land and they're in the water, everything's fine. But then in the evenings, they come out of the water to eat the grass. And so I was told in many, many places that I camped, they would basically say, go to bed at like sunset and do not get out of your like bed for any reason whatsoever. Do not walk on the ground because hippos, if they see you at night, they feel really threatened. And hippos actually kill more people in Africa than every other animal combined. So they are extremely dangerous when they're on the land. So like moose in Canada. Kind of like moose, yeah. And, and I would say like as big. It was staggering the times I saw a hippo out of the water to, to really try and understand just how immense they are. I don't actually know what causes it. I think they are very territorial when they're in the water. And so I guess maybe that carries over to when they're out on the land as well and they just go into sort of attack defense mode sure. and yeah, plow down anyone that they can. They might actually feel more vulnerable on the land if they're used to being in the water. Mm. And, and as an illustration of that, there was a couple of times I did like a guided walking safari in a national park where you're actually allowed to go out on foot, uh, but a ranger has to come with you and he's carrying like a 416 Rigby, like literally an elephant gun. And, you know, he's kind of carrying it over his shoulder nonchalantly. Right. And so we're, so we're walking along and we see like elephants not too far away and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll be fine. Just, you know, don't get any closer and, and whatever else. And then we see a lion and it is like crouching down, staring at us like it's going to pounce on us. So, of course, my heart rate goes to about a 1,000. Mm. And so immediately I'm like, oh, my God, man, like aren't you even going to like load the rifle or point it in the general direction of the lion in case it moves? And he was like, no, nah, lions never attack people in groups. It's essentially unheard of ever. He's like, but I tell you what, if that was a hippo, I would absolutely already be like locked and loaded and ready because a hippo will come and charge us. No, no question. So, so the lion's just waiting for one of you to stray away and then that's his meal. That's right. Yeah. And I think they're pretty smart and opportunistic, whereas a hippo is just more like a tank and will just come running on through. And so, yeah, he said in all his years working at the national park, the only time he had ever actually had to shoot anything, it was actually a hippo, never a lion, never an elephant. Not, you know, not the big ones that you would kind of assume to be dangerous. Right. The, the, yeah, the, the hippos are the ones. Can you outrun a hippo? Oh, I would, looking at a hippo, I would say yes, but uh, maybe why? they're a bit, maybe they're a bit, oh, they have tiny little stubby legs and, and they weigh so much. You just, even when they walk, it almost looks like they can't walk. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, w- I, think, I would think they would be slow given all that, but you never know. And I think somebody, they're more like series trucks, Harold. Once they get up to speed, then you need to be careful. It's it's that how long it takes to get to zero to 60. It could be a while. Which means they don't stop well either. <laughs> they probably don't stop. Right. Exactly. They leak. And I think it's always surprising how fast wild animals can be. Like, yeah. you, you know, you, you realize how quick a bear can be or, and you just, it's staggering. They have driving parks. Like, you know, of course, I know we have very tame animals here and they feed them very well. Uh, that, that happens. But uh, are there you know, parks where you can drive by, you know, drive through, drive your vehicle? Uh, maybe that's a little too touristy, but just kind of curious. Oh, yeah, no, all of them. Absolutely. That's basically what you do. I mean, a lot of them, they say you have to stay on the tracks that are already made. So you're not supposed to just drive off anywhere you want. But I mean, even when I was in a park like that, there was a pride of lions literally sleeping on the track. So I drove within four feet of a bunch of lions, you know, like yeah. I was afraid to put the window down to take a photo because they were so close. And that's when you're in a park, but also like when you're just out in these dry riverbeds or salt pans or wherever you are, there's no rules of any kind. There's no fences. There's no anything. You could, if you wanted to drive up and pet an elephant. I mean, nothing physically stops you doing that. Obviously, it would be a very bad idea. Except maybe the elephant might stop you from doing that. I'm pretty sure he'd have something to say about it. But in terms of could you, I mean, you could. (laughs) I wouldn't recommend it. (laughs) Did you get a lot of good photos? Oh, so I think I took about 30,000 photos actually on the whole trip. And there were days where, you know, sitting in the driver's seat, I didn't even need the zoom lens on my camera because they were so close. It was like, oh, I zoomed all the way out. I'm still too zoomed in. Like I have to swap to my other lens. It's just staggering, staggering. The, the amount of wildlife also, it's kind of hard to grasp. You know, we see these documentaries or whatever, and, and I always thought it was kind of fake, but it is totally real where you can just drive into this kind of little grassy area, almost looks like farmland, but it's wild. It's natural. And in the middle of the farmland, there might be a few thousand Gemsbok things, which are sort of like deer and then bigger versions of deer. And then there's some zebras in the background. There's a giraffe walking by, you know, there's crocodiles and hippos are in the mud pit that's in the middle of all of this. So there's maybe a few thousand animals in sight. And then literally 50 yards away, lounging in the shade is a whole pride of lions just watching this whole show. And so you can tell all the animals are kind of nervous and looking around and, and the lions are just waiting and they're like, Oh, well, if we don't get you today, we'll get you tomorrow. It doesn't really matter. They're just, they're just looking at the menu. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I I thought that was kind of like a little bit staged or not real when you see those nature documentaries, but it's a hundred percent true. And you can be so focused on like watching this giraffe walk by. And then when you look, Oh, just next to him, there's like 10 zebras. Oh, next to him. Now there's a hippo and like, it's really amazing. And then, of course, you probably should look over your shoulder once in a while to see what might be behind you. Well, I liked to do that while I was sitting in the driver's seat. That was always my, my favorite place to be. I highly recommend listeners go out to your, your website because you have a breakdown of your journey by country under Africa Expedition because it's just randomly I, I picked a picked one of the countries, Namibia, and there, in fact, as you say, there's elephants across the bonnet of a Jeep Rubicon and there's a... <laughs> What is it? A crowd? A pride? It's not a pride of lions. What is it? A crowd? Is it a Ooh. lions are a pride? And uh, but there's a, we have a group of elephants here across the bonnet. So uh, yes, that matches with what you tell us, Dan. <laughs> True stories, true stories. True stories, absolutely, absolutely. And you also have video out there too, do you not? I do, yeah. I, I filmed video in every country in Africa, and that's all on my YouTube channel as well. And it's, yeah, mostly just me, you know, with my GoPro or with my kind of handheld camera. And so it's not edited well. It's not a documentary. Uh, I didn't have a film crew or a support vehicle. It really is just me showing what it looked like when I was out there by myself most of the time. No, it's it's The Road Chose Me, supported by by Dan Greck. I mean, you were, you're the sponsor, the the producer. The... <laughs> That's right. I was the mechanic, the chef, the logistics organizer, the visa person, mm-hmm. the medic. The it was, and, and some days that's a great feeling to to sort of be everything. And then of course other days it was exhausting and overwhelming, and I just needed to take a break. Yeah, it's great when things are going well, but when it's not, then you don't have anybody else to blame. Yeah, or just anyone else for support, even just to bounce ideas off of, or just to sort of say, like, does this sound like a good idea, or have I kind of lost the plot a little right. bit? 
Like, for instance, when you roll your Jeep in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. A little yeah, support might have been good. Yeah. Is it a good idea that I should just put this back on with duct tape? Or uh, I don't really know anymore. The day may come and you might want to reinforce that duct tape with a zip tie or two. Oh, yeah. They come and go. And, and actually, the, the rear view mirror snapped right off. And so I had some guys on the side of the road weld it back together for me. And I had that mirror until well, late if, last If year. you can call what they did welding. Yeah. I, re- they, I read that part. But yes, it's it's a joining of metals sort of-ish. They probably did a better job than I can, in all honesty. It, it kept the mirror upon the side of your truck for a while. So it did, oh, it did what it had to do. It stayed there for about a year and a half. And then late last year, I clipped it on a tree branch and actually snapped it off again. <laughs> And so I had to pony up the $30 for a new mirror, which was a shame. I I immensely enjoyed the book, though, I I must say, uh, in some ways more than the first book, although that was very good as well. But but yeah, I I think what what really caught my attention was uh, not the the travel aspect, because Overland books kind of all pretty much had the same material, the compulsories, as I said, the, the border crossings, the bribes, the, the scenery, the animals. But I really enjoyed your take on the politics and, and what has happened to Africa and, and how it became that way and who's to blame for it. I really enjoyed that part of it because that was very unique. Oh, thanks, Harold. Yeah, I you know, it, it's one of those funny things. Once you've been there for three months, you think you know everything and you have it all figured out. <laughs> and, then, and then after six months, you realize that you were an idiot and now it's all, you know, now you're wise. And, and kind of every six or 12 months, that kept happening to me where I'm like, oh, and you get to see things from the other perspective, which is really, really amazing to see it from the inside. So by the time you're done, you're an expert in the things you don't know. Exactly right. There's a very long list of those things. Did you see a lot of the, the Chinese are supposedly building lots of roads? Did you come across that? Oh, in hundreds and hundreds of towns, there are entire like thousand person cities, many thousand people of Chinese people. All the road signs are in Chinese. All the heavy equipment is Chinese and they are building freeways, dams, bridges, deep sea shipping ports, mines, railways, everything you can imagine. And they are building it. 20 times faster, 100 times faster than we ever built anything in our countries. Well, as I recall, they're, they're doing that expressly for the purpose of extracting minerals. So I would think that the quicker they can do that, the more efficient that part of their operation is. That's right. Yeah. The, the standard deal they make with African governments is, you know, give us really good mining rights and really good fishing rights. And we'll, you know, build a railway because that'll be good for you. And maybe we'll build a freeway and yeah, yeah, we'll help you with some infrastructure that you guys maybe don't have the skills to do, like a, a big hydroelectric dam. Yeah, but reliable then, power plant, for instance. Mm. But then we get to take, you know, all of the bauxite out for kind of 10% of whatever the world recognized price is. Still, I mean, I mean, Africa has a tradition of being exploited for their for their resources. At least this deal gets them something in return. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's kind of the insight that I came to uh, after years on the ground, realizing that, well, actually, they're helping and they really are improving the lives of, of everyday Africans, which I think is more than we ever did for them with our kind of economic enslavement and our, you know, just brutal policies well, when, when we went in there. It, actual it, it, enslavement as well. That's right. Yeah. And we just took endlessly and, you know, they never got anything back out of that deal. Whereas at least from the Chinese, they are getting something in return. So how many total miles did you travel and how long did it take? So in Africa, I drove 54,000 miles over three years, um, which turns out not to be much of an average per day at all, because the whole point of the trip was to, to get maximum enjoyment and to see and do everything that I wanted to, because I figure it's a once in a lifetime. I, I doubt that I'll ever you know, have the time or the money or the vehicle to just go and, you know, explore the Congo or Cameroon. And so I really did. I detoured as much as I could whenever there was a waterfall or if a local said, you know, you really should try and get here. I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to try and go to that national park. I don't even know what's there, but I'll go and find out. 
Well, if a local tells you you should check it out, chances are they know what they're talking about. Exactly right. Yeah. What about the food? It seems like the, I, I, I hear very little of, of food from Africa, you know, maybe the occasional Ethiopian restaurant. That's, that's something I don't hear much about. Yeah. Again, it, it really varies widely from country to country. I would say the staple really is like beans and rice in many countries. Um, some sort of spicy stew that might have beef or goat or chicken in it, which was always delicious. And I loved eating it on the side of the road. Um, and then a few countries dotted around kind of, you know, they have their little specialty of their region and they're, they're super proud of their food and extraordinarily delicious. So I would say I ate street food nearly every day of the trip and there was probably only one or two things that I wouldn't happily order again where I was, yeah, nearly always it was just downright delicious. And and often I did order a second plate because I love to eat. <laughs> hey, good. There we go. We, you and I share that in common. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you eat a lot of bush meat? No, I ate almost no bush meat. The problem is when I was there, the Ebola outbreak had just been contained in kind of Sierra Leone and Liberia. And Ebola, one of the primary ways you can catch it is by eating bats or eating monkeys, which are really common bush meat. Right. And so if you're eating unidentified meat, you don't know, it could be a bat or a monkey. So then you might be exposing yourself to Ebola. So pretty early on, I just had to set a rule on myself of, if I don't know what the animal is, I can't eat it, which is a shame because I love eating unidentified meat, but <laughs> <laughs> so be it. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess the, the addendum to that question was, I mean, maybe you don't know you're eating bush meat, but you are mistakenly. I mean, how do you deal with that? That could be a thing for sure. Um, I would usually ask the, the lady serving the pot of stew or kind of clarify, you know, what is it? I would ask the question and, and nine times out of 10, it was beef or goat. It wasn't until kind of you got really remote or you were really out there, literally the guy is holding up a dead monkey, you know, and it's for sale and like he'll happily cook it for you or, or, or sell it to your hole. So it was, yeah, it was sort of more on out of the way places where it was more likely. Especially if you don't know the language and you're having to hand gesture it. Yeah, and French in West Africa really is universal. It is the language that 99% of people speak. So it, it did work really well. Yeah, did, if you, I guess if you know who the colonial oppressor was, wherever you are, you know what language to speak. That is exactly right, Harold. It's either French or Portuguese or uh, English. That will get you around Africa, no problem. Do you speak another language? I learned French along the way in Africa, um, and I learned Spanish on my first trip. So I use that in all the Portuguese countries in Africa, and, and it worked well enough. So you like to just show up in these places and, and learn the language as you go then? Pretty much, Harold. Yeah, I, I tried to take lessons for French wow. um, while I was in Canada, and it was a horrible experience. They kind of sit you in a classroom, and they try to teach you how to say window and grandmother and the days of the week. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, you know, I spent two years in Latin America and I still don't know how to say those things in Spanish because they're not useful for, for sort of everyday life on the street. Open the window is kind of a useless expression in Africa. I imagine there aren't many windows to be opened and closed. <laughs> and it's just not the kind of, I don't know, conversation that I even want to have with somebody. So I guess I just sort of get down at street level and I'm like, you know, how am I going to buy gas? How am I going to yeah. buy food? Please, thank you. Yes, no, maybe right. like the real basics. But and then from there, you just slowly build up and build up until you can basically have conversations. And of course, if you were in Canada, you were probably learning Quebecois French, which is slightly different. Quebecois is not really any sort of French, but Canadian French is different as well. And with my accent here too, everyone just tries to correct me all day long, which gets very <laughs> frustrating. Whereas in Africa or in Latin America, people are just so happy that you're trying to speak their language. Right. They couldn't care less if you have a terrible accent and you use a few bad grammar words. Right. It's just, they're just so happy that you're there and you're saying hello and you, you know, you're being friendly. That really is the, the most important thing. So yeah, I always try to stress to people, if, if you try to learn a language in your country, the, the reactions you're going to get and the way people are going to treat you, it'll be vastly different than when you're actually out in you know remote places around the world. I think when you're trying to learn it in a classroom environment, the, the person who's being paid to teach you is kind of all caught up in knowing more than you about the language and, and trying to make sure you do it their way and using their constructs. It's kind of not the point of learning language. I agree with that 100%. And so I pretty much have sworn off <laughs> classroom learning for a language for, for me and the way my brain works anyway. And and I guess too, I'm, I'm okay with like, I'll never pass a test in Spanish. You know, I, I don't formally speak it. 
but I can certainly go out and have fun and, you know, have a good time and chat to people. And that's really what my goal is instead of, you know, correctness. As long as they're not giving uh, language tests at the border crossing, you'll be okay, right? Exactly right. Yep. And even if they are giving language tests, I'll, I'll just try to make them laugh until they approve me. <laughs> And I, I suspect that most folks you know, have some sort of passing English it's just because that's lingua franca. Yeah, I would say most places, at a minimum, they're going to speak five words of English and, and you would get by if you didn't speak a single other language. You could get the trip done. And then there's pointing. Oh, totally. Pointing, smiling, thumbs up. Always. Yeah. Very universal. For anyone contemplating visiting Africa, similar to you, but, you know, trying to maybe do some overlanding, is there a good resource or, or maybe some sort of advice you'd like to give? Yeah. I mean, my biggest piece of advice is like, absolutely go for it. It is unbelievably beautiful and friendly and welcoming. And what I did is really overwhelming, you know, trying to ship your vehicle over there, dealing with all of that and kind of the length of the trip and everything. And I totally understand lots of people aren't going to do that. But what you can do is fly into Namibia or fly into South Africa and they have fleets of rental vehicles that are totally decked out for overlanding. So I saw them at the Johannesburg airport, Avis, if you Google it, Avis have rental overland vehicles. They have rooftop tents, fridges, camp chairs, cutlery, even bedding, everything ready to go. I saw fleets of like hundreds of them sitting in the airport. You can fly in from about $100 a day you can get one of these vehicles and you can choose, you could go on a guided trip where you're in a group of maybe five vehicles and they'll take you around to different places. Or you can choose to just totally strike out on your own if, if you feel confident. Or you can even do a bit of a hybrid where they'll start you out on a guided trip and so you, you sort of get your feet on the ground and they might even take you into another country so you, you understand what the border crossings are like. And then after a month, they sort of say, oh yeah, do, do you feel pretty good with this? Go for it, you know. And, and so you can choose, and, and I met hundreds of people doing this, people who never even checked their own oil, who didn't know how to change a tire on their car, and they were out driving where I was, looking at elephants and having these amazing experiences. And it was about $100 a day to get the vehicle. And, you know, they were loving it. They had no stress. If, if the vehicle broke down, they had a sat the part of the rental is they give you a satellite phone. You just call the company. They'll bring you a replacement vehicle you get to drive away in the replacement while they deal with the broken one. In terms of, you know, go and have adventures and see wild animals and all the beautiful stuff, that's definitely the way to do it. So, so if, if, for instance, you rent one of these and you drive it into Uganda and you forget to set the parking brake and you roll it over while you're on your own, can you call them on said sat phone and they'll come get you and give you another? I suppose so. <laughs> um, Good to know. Read the fine print. I mean, I, I definitely, you get insurance, you know, for things like traffic accidents, but I did meet people who, you know, they'd had a flat tire and so they called on the sat phone and it was fixed, no problem. So it really works. People are, people are out there doing it. There were thousands and thousands more tourists roaming around than I ever knew or really dreamed was even possible. And the other cool thing is that you can have this adventure in a vehicle that we can't get here. A hundred percent. Yeah. Most of them are like turbo diesel Hiluxes or even turbo diesel Ford Rangers. And then if you wanted to, like if you've got a big family, you can get a Defender 110, a brand new one. You can get a Land Cruiser Troopy. It's, it's your choice what you rent. And yeah, they're really, really decked out awesome vehicles. Really a hundred dollars a day for all that is good deal. Yeah. And to just have no stress and it's all organized for you. Uh, I talked to some people who were like, yeah, we fly in once a year and do this. And we just know, we, like we land in the airport, half an hour later, we're in the vehicle, we drive around the corner to a supermarket, stock the fridge, and then boom, we're out in the wilderness and we see elephants. Like, no problem, just like that. So Dan, you have a website called theroadchoseme.com and it's spelled out theroadchoseme.com. We'll have a link, of course, in the show notes where folks can find everything you've just discussed plus and more and more <laughs> and including but wait, your, there's more your book is available. I assume through the website, I take it. It'll, it'll, there'll be links then to wherever they can pick up the book. I assume that's it's better, right. better to buy it through you than probably other normal online, large retailers. Uh, it's actually, it's sold on Amazon okay. and that's kind of the one and only you can get a digital copy or a print edition from Amazon. And it has pictures, pictures in the book. 
it does have pictures in the book. That's the written account. And then I've also published a photography book from Africa as well. You asked about, you know, did I take good photos? You be the judge. I published a, a 75 page full color, you know, coffee table book of every country that I went to and the things that I saw, the people I met. It's not uh, a storybook, you know, it doesn't go into detail. It really is just photographs from the trip. And that's called 999 Days Around Africa. Couldn't there just is... stay that extra day. <laughs> it's funny, Harold. It totally was unintentional. I, um, you know, I was keeping track the whole trip of what date I'd entered each country and how many miles per country. And then uh, the final day, it was a nightmare getting the Jeep out of Egypt and kind of delays, delays, delays. I finally got it locked in. Yeah, I remember that Dana. story. That 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 was yeah. an interesting story. Ah, oh, bureaucracy at its best. And so I raced back to the yeah, place. They've that got was, one of the best ones there. Oh, they they top everyone else by far. And so yeah, I tried to book a flight for that evening, and there weren't any. So I just booked one for the following day. And then the next morning, I was drinking a coffee, kind of relaxing. You know, the final moments in Africa. And I just absentmindedly went on one of those online calculators where it's like calculate the number of days between two dates. So I put in the date that I drove into Morocco and I put in that day, which I was flying out of Egypt and it said 999. That was it. It was done. I, the plane, you know, I was getting on the plane about two hours after that mentally, wow. I guess. So what is next for Dan Greck? I, I suppose you're not going to continue to sit in uh, British Columbia and uh, wait for it to warm up. I am not. Well, I think no. you've seen what there is to see and learn the language. So you know, it might be time <laughs> to move on. Have you learned the language? Have you learned Canadian? Some people would dispute whether I speak English or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I have big plans, John. I am very close to kicking off my next major one. So I'm going to a whole new continent with a whole new vehicle, all new adventures, I plan it to be something about a year, a year and a half, probably 40,000 miles. Not taking, with, the old, not taking the old Rubicon, huh? Not taking the old Rubicon, no. Um, and when you hear about the destination, you'll understand why. But at this particular moment, I'm not currently disclosing the destination because COVID is just kicking my plans. I've already had to change destination twice. And I feel like if I say I'm going to somewhere and then I don't, people are going to get really uppity at me. So it's kind of easier just to wait until I know with 100% certainty. Wait till the coast is clear and then you can... You know, always wait, wait till you get back and tell us where you went. There we go. That's yes. true too. And, and I would rather <laughs> little, be a person... little mystery book thing going on. Yeah. I'd rather be a person who, who just really does things instead of kind of sitting around talking about doing things all the time. Um, so it's so it's about time that I got going again. I think I, I feel the need. And is, when is that plan to start? I understand, you know, with COVID, understand, but you know, if you let's assume it clears in a year, are you looking at you know, to get moving in 2022? I take it. No, actually, I'm planning to hit the road here in June of this year. So oh, just wow. a few months now. Okay. Yeah, I actually uh, behind me on camera, there are things sitting there that are part of the expedition that I just ordered them and maps and. Yeah, things are actually happening, which is pretty exciting. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Well, well, we look forward to finding out where your next destination is. I, I was hoping you, you were going to say Mars, and then I would say <laughs> there is a Mars, Pennsylvania. Okay, yeah, I could look into that. Um, or I could try and get friends with Elon Musk, I guess. That would be you the could. alternative. There is, yeah. uh, there is, I just read this yesterday, I think there is uh, several billionaires, one from Japan who is looking for regular folks, you know, uh, to take them into space. So maybe that could be your on your, on your list. Of course, if you go to Mars, you can't do it in a Jeep. You have to be in a Rover. You got to be in a Rover. Yeah. Ah, very good. Maybe I'll just bring a little Jeep sticker and, um, well, but if I do that, maybe it'll break down. So who knows? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> they, they all break down eventually. That's right. Dan, uh, it was great having you back and talking about Africa. It sounds amazing. Uh, I look forward to checking out your, your photographs, especially because I like looking at the photographs. I, I'm looking forward to volume three. Absolutely, Harold. There will be a volume three about this whole new expedition. So it's about time I need to go and actually have the adventure. And then I promise I'll write a book about the adventure. Cool. <laughs> and folks can find that all at theroadchoseme.com. And uh, what about, Dan, like uh, ongoing updates? Like, are you on uh, Facebook or Twitter or something where you give you know hmm. updates of what's happening in the moment? Yeah. Instagram, I'm The Road Chose Me. Um, and I'm focusing really heavily on YouTube these days as well. So Lots of videos lately about how to do what I've done, how to cross borders, how to deal with visas and paperwork and money and all of that. 
and then soon there'll be lots of videos about the new trip and I'll, I'll document that whole thing on YouTube. You, you building a rocket to get you into space. That's right. Yes. Yep. How to yeah. strap yourself effectively to a big rocket. Yeah. I think, I think Wiley, Wiley Coyote already covered that. Ah, I should change my name. And, and I did promise myself for the next trip, I'm going to go somewhere that has no humidity and somewhere that has no malaria. They were, they were my two promises to myself when I was feeling not good. We're back to space and again. I think you're, exactly. You're, yeah. I, yeah. I like Mars sounds like a great option, actually. Win win. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to Mars, let us know. I will. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it coming on the show. Thank you guys again. Really good fun. This has been show number 96, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Dixon, Harold, and Morgan for joining us on the podcast again this month. Eight years. Yes. April is our eighth year. Well, we have completed completed eight years. So, yeah, the, the anniversary of, of episode one will be next month. And fast approaching episode 100. Not bad. Whoops. <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> Dixon has fallen out of the sky creeper. And also thanks to Dan Greck for coming on the show and talking about his journeys in Africa. I highly recommend you check out his webpage and his books. Uh, very good information. And his YouTube as well. And also to the One True Packs for his continued production support. Thanks, Pax, for helping out, making the show sound better. I know most probably don't hear about him or know that he's out there doing it, but he is. And uh, we do appreciate it. He's a Disco One owner. So if you, any any Disco One you see in the New York area. Yeah, it must be Pax because there's only going to be one Disco One in the entire state of New York. It'll be Pax. Guaranteed. Wave to him. We're part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the 4x4 related shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. Visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's podcast. If you're listening to the podcast on our website, I suggest you download a podcast app and subscribe so the podcast is automatically downloaded when it's available. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, and voicemail, and you can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer. You can buy a t-shirt, sticker, or buy us a tea. Click on store on the menu of our webpage. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Click on voicemail on the website and let us know. The next voicemail will receive a free center steer t-shirt. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. And you may now resume your important things. At least we won't have to say Land Rover, Range Rover, Road Rover.